Scott, what are some of the things that people need to watch out for that they're not thinking about? No, that's a very good question. All this stuff sounds great, but a lot of times you have to go back to the basics. And um, you know, one thing that we're recommending for all our clients is everybody must go back and have their wills reviewed. Because like we said, we talked about an increase in exemption from a million to five million dollars. I'm going to give you an example of one situation that I have, I have right now. We have a client who hasn't taken a look at his will since 1997 when the estate exemption was $600,000. So at that point in time, you know, he had young adult children. Maybe he was worth five, six million dollars at that point in time. He said, you know what, if something happens to me, I'm going to leave whatever the exemption amount is that escapes federal estate taxation to my children outright. And what's ever left, I'm going to give to my wife outright. So, you know, when I had $5 million of assets, it made sense. He had three young adult children. He gave them $200,000 each. It sounds fine. Well, now fast forward to today. The exemption is $5 million. So people typically have clauses in their wills that say, I leave the maximum amount that can avoid federal estate taxes either outright to my kids or in a trust to the benefit, for the benefit of my spouse and maybe children, and then the rest either goes outright or in trust to my surviving spouse. Well, let's say I'm sitting here today and I'm worth six or seven million dollars and my will says five million dollars goes outright to my children and the rest goes outright to my surviving spouse. That's generally not going to be the result that you're looking for impoverishing your wife and getting all that money outright to your kids. And in addition to that, remember we're talking about the increase in the exemption from a million to five. Well, a lot of states like New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Jersey, have in effect decoupled from the federal estate tax system. And what that means is that, you know, regardless of the fact that we talk about a 35% tax rate, what we have when we're talking about a New Yorker, remember we used in our example a 45.4% estate tax rate. New York has a top marginal rate of 16%. You get to deduct it on your federal return, but on a net basis it comes out that the tax rate in effect is slightly over 45% rather than 35%. In addition to that, New York has frozen its exemption to a million dollars as opposed to the five million using the, uh, the exemption that was in effect back in 2001. So in our example, if we left $5 million outright to someone other than the spouse, say the children, not only would we be do, doing something that economically doesn't make sense, we would be triggering a New York State estate tax at the first death of almost $400,000. Also, not a result that someone's anticipated. So it's it's very important that everybody goes back and looks at their wills and sees what do the wills say, what is our asset situation, do both spouses have five million dollars in their names to use this exemption. You know, one thing that's new in the law that we haven't spoken about yet is a concept called portability. Portability means that at the death of the first spouse, if they haven't used their entire five million dollar exemption, then the surviving spouse in most situations can use it when they die. That was put in there as a safeguard because a lot of times people didn't do proper planning to make sure they were maximizing the utilization of the, of the exemption in each estate. But that should only be looked at as a fallback. There are a lot of different, um, different pitfalls in counting on that to solve for all your estate planning needs. So it's very important that everyone goes back and looks at their and looks at their wills to make sure that you know the assets are titled properly, and that we're using the the exemptions in the most intelligent way. Because the most important thing is to make sure that the husband and wife are taken care of, and then doing estate planning like we're speaking about in an intelligent way to just try to pass on as much as you can to your children and grandchildren in a tax efficient way by looking at the wills and seeing how the assets are titled, at least we can make sure the basics are taken care of and that we're not doing something that, you know, in hindsight will, will not make sense. There's very easy ways to solve for a lot of these different issues through setting up um, clauses. The best message I could send to anyone is you can build all kinds of flexibility into the wills, you know, without a lot of, of effort. There are things called disclaimers and optional Q-tip trust elections that we can use. But the most important thing is if we know what the basics are and how things are set up and what the wills say, only then can we solve for these things. I think it's pretty fair to say 
this is a lot of material, can be pretty complicated, and whoever is going to sort of undertake this process had better make sure they're dealing with someone who is pretty informed to make sure they avoid the pitfalls and take advantage of the opportunities. Absolutely. The opportunities are there. We gave only a couple of examples. We tried to demonstrate how the wills work and why we need to take a look at those. But very important to have a good team of people helping you. You know, the uh, you know we can get in there and help and um, and certainly lay out a lot of uh, you know the different factors. But need to have a very good estate planning attorney as part of the team. Make sure the documents are drafted properly and the planning is done in the right way. So while the opportunities are there, the minefields are there as well, and we have to watch out for them. Scott, thanks for being here today. You're very welcome, Mort.